Hey there, this is Mike Kramer, Mock Capital. Today is April 30th. Tomorrow is going to start what's going to be a very intense couple of days for markets. There's going to be a lot of data points coming out, mostly related to jobs. We're going to have the quarterly refunding announcement tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. And of course, we're going to have the FOMC uh, policy meeting uh, tomorrow, concluding with the at 2 p.m. press release. And then at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, you'll be getting Jay Powell in the press conference. So we're going to start tomorrow at 8.15 in the morning. ADP, we're looking for 180,000 jobs, basically in line with last month's reading of 184,000. Then at 10 a.m., we're going to get the jolts. We're looking for a slight downward move to 8.69 million from 8.756 million. ISM manufacturing, we're looking for 50 versus 50.3. Prices paid, 55.4 versus 55.8. Uh, new orders, 51 versus 51.4. Employment, 48.2 versus 47.4. Then uh, at 2 o'clock, we'll be getting that uh, FOMC policy, this policy decision. On the second, we're looking for non-farm productivity. We're looking for an increase of 0.7% for the first quarter preliminary reading versus last quarter's 3.3%. Unit labor costs is expected to increase to 3.6% from 0.4%. Initial jobless claims basically unchanged, continuing claims basically unchanged. And then, of course, we're going to go into Friday with our change in non-farm payroll. We're looking for 240,000 new jobs who have been created in April, down from 303. The unemployment rate's expected to stay flat at 3.8%. Average hourly earnings increasing by 0.3% in line with last month. Average earn hourly earnings year over year expected to be 4% versus 4.1% last month. And then finishing up Friday uh, at 10 a.m., we're going to get ISM services, 52 versus 51.4 last month. Uh, and so it's going to be a very, very busy week. Uh, additionally, like I stated already, you're also going to be getting that government, uh, that U.S. Treasury quarterly refunding announcement tomorrow morning at 830. And this is really just going to tell us how the government plans to fund all of its debt that it's issuing Will, will come in the form of treasury bills, will come more in terms of treasury notes or treasury bonds, and that will kind of give us an idea in terms of what the what the treasury is thinking about in terms of supply, and that could, of course, uh, impact interest rates, especially on the longer duration side of things. Uh, when we look at the two-year yield, which is what we tend to start off with, we're inching, we're inching further and further away from that 5% level, uh, moving up to 5.04%. Uh, moving up towards the upper end of what appears to be a bull flag, although it is starting to get kind of elongated. So if we don't start seeing some sort of pop higher in the next day or two, uh, or I would say by Friday at the latest, if we don't see a pop higher at five over this 5.03-5.05% region, then we might want to start thinking about the two-year rate actually starting to turn lower because there's certainly been ample opportunity for it to move higher. Again, I think if it does move higher, we're talking about a two-year that could start moving up into the 5.1 and potentially as high as 5.25%. In fact, when you look at the sort of 100% uh, one, uh, extension of the cup and handle, it actually comes out to 5.38%. And when you do the 161.8 extension, of the bull flag, it comes out to 5.38 percent. So, it, so it's an interesting uh, sort of scenario here, with the Fibonacci uh, relationship suggesting even a rate higher than five and a quarter percent. And I guess it's just sort of odd that they both worked out to be at that 5.38 percent level. Um, something that we should certainly be aware of and keep uh, eyes on. Uh, the ten-year rate uh, also continuing its move higher today. Uh, it moved closer to 4.68%. So again, we're inching above that 4.65 region of resistance, and it looks like we're getting closer and closer to that, you know, uh, that escape velocity needed to really get the five-year, the ten-year moving up towards that 5% level, which is the level that we've been sort of talking about. Certainly, the momentum is there. Uh, when we look at the dollar, the dollar index also has what looks like a bull flag in it. Again, we've talked about the dollar index uh, at length in the past. Uh, again, if this is a diamond reversal pattern, we could be talking about a dollar index that has much, much further to go. Uh, you can see that we are, again, sort of breaking out of what looks to be a bull flag in the dollar index, which could obviously suggest uh, if we get above this 107 
uh, area of resistance, there could be much further to go as well. Uh, and it's really just the inverse in the euro where you have this, uh, in, this diamond top potential with this being one leg uh, and this potentially forming a second leg down, uh, which could return the euro somewhere below parity. Uh, again, if we're looking at the dollar index and finding a um, bull flag, then when you look at the euro, you can look at the euro and find uh, the opposite, which is a bear flag. And that would certainly suggest that if we were to break below this 106 area, uh, we could be looking at a retest of this 104 and a half area, potentially with much further to go. And the Fed meeting itself may give us a little bit of a clue in terms of where the euro and the dollar are going to go, just because if you get a J-PAL that's more hawkish, uh, leaning more towards this idea of fewer rate cuts than what the Fed was previously laying out, uh, that there may not be any rate cuts until the very end of the year, that the inflation process has stalled, you would look for the euro to begin to move down to 104 and a half. And really, it's the same thing uh, with the pound, where the pound has moved back up to this uh, 125 region with the potential to start moving back down to 122. Again, if you get a more hawkish than expected j Powell. And just like we had identified a bear flag a couple of weeks ago, there's another uh, you know, bear flag forming in the pound as well, which also suggests that there's still potentially uh, further to go. And certainly the momentum uh, is pointing that way. When we look at the yen, the uh, Japanese officials finally decided to intervene when we hit 160. That's a very big level, as we've discussed before. That goes back to a region of resistance at this uh, area in the spring of 1990. If the uh, monetary officials in Japan and the Bank of Japan were to allow the yen to really weaken versus the 160 level, uh, the next area I would be looking for comes uh, closer to 164 and a half to 165. Um, it's not taking the yen very long to start moving back up again after that big hit from the intervention that took place yesterday. So again, this 160 region in here is the area that we need to watch. But again, you start getting you know a Jay Powell that's more hawkish than expected. You start getting economic data this week that supports a fundamental weakening of the yen versus the dollar. Uh, again, it becomes hard to sort of intervene in a market like that. Uh, but again, we always need to be aware of the risks. Uh, finally, I'm going to touch on the Canadian dollar, one that we don't talk about much. Uh, I just found it interesting about the Canadian dollar is really uh, how important it has been in terms of marking turning points in the S&P 500 and the U.S. markets. Uh, we can see that the last couple of times it's gotten up to this 138 and a half area. It's uh, marked significant bottoms in the S&P 500. So if we were to, for some reason, actually see the Canadian dollar break out and up above 130 and a half, it could be an indication that the markets here in the U.S. have a little bit further to go. Again, if you sort of look at the Canadian dollar, uh, just like many of the other currencies we're looking at, it also appears that there is a, uh, a bull flag forming in the Canadian dollar versus the U.S. dollar and that the USD CAD has a little bit further room to go. And then finally, with the Swiss franc, we saw that actually break out of what was a bull flag today. Uh, and as you can see, um, and this is potentially setting up for a test at this 92 cent region. Uh, and really, the bigger area I would be looking for is up around 94, just because, again, we've been kind of consolidating here now for a little bit. Uh, when we move into markets, when we look at the, the DAX, um, you can see that the DAX, remember we were talking about resistance. The DAX has had this sort of odd pattern the last couple of days where it moved up 1.5%, gave it all back, moved up another 1.5%, gave it all back. Uh, you can clearly see that we're sort of just hitting up against resistance at a trend line. And, uh, you know, momentum is clearly, again, fading for the DAX. Uh, and so when we look at the DAX on a closer basis here, um, we can see what almost is beginning to look like a double top pattern uh, forming. Uh, clearly, if we were to break this area of uh, support here around 17,800, it could lead to a bigger drop and an undercut of the 17,600 region, which starts to open doors to even lower levels and a potential gap fill around 17,130, which would take us back to mid-February levels. So this is a very important area to watch. Clearly, uh, if we break out above 18,220, 
we're talking about an index that can start to go much higher. Uh, the FTSE also has had a really strong run recently. Um, when we look at the FTSE, it's gone on to a new all-time high. Uh, we're going to want to, again, pay attention to this because the FTSE really has traded a lot with um, commodity prices overall since it has a lot of uh, mining stocks that are in it. Uh, you know, one thing that is worth noting is that uh, the FTSE has actually traded a lot with copper uh, over the last uh, several years. Uh, and so uh, copper actually started taking a pretty big hit today in the U.S., so you're going to want to watch perhaps maybe the direction of copper because if copper prices start declining, that could be giving us an indication in terms of where the FTSE may be heading. Uh, and of course, uh, we're going to want to watch this level of uh, resistance right in this area up at what could be a high around uh, this region in here around 8200. Uh, a break, obviously, of uh, support at 8150 sets up a potential return to this 8075 region. When we swing over to U.S. indexes, uh, the Nasdaq had a pretty big uh, down day today, dropping by about 2%. Uh, we've now filled the gap that was created uh, basically from Friday. Uh, at this point, though, it looks like there's a bear flag that's forming in the, the Nasdaq 100. And... Um, if we were to see the Nasdaq actually break lower tomorrow, undercut or gap below this 17,370, 17,390 region, that would be a break of the trend and the bear flag and potentially set up uh, a break of this 17,100 area of support and a return back down to 16,500, 16,600 region. Uh, clearly, the upside is resistance at 17,800. Uh, when we look, um, when you look again, uh, notice that we got above the 10 day exponential moving average for just two days and then moved back sharply below it today. And this could be sort of an indication that we are indeed in some sort of move lower because if you notice and you go back in time, you'll notice that every time we slip below the 10 day exponential moving average in this uptrend, it was only for a day or two. In fact, here you can see we dropped below it two days and popped above it. Here we dropped below it two days and popped above it. Here we dropped below it for one day and came. And then it was like we began to change here. Uh, and now to now we bop, you know, popped two days above it and now we're back below it. Uh, and really when we look at the S&P 500, it's also a similar pattern closing below the 10 day exponential moving average, similar sort of, you know, two days below, back above, uh, again, two days above, back below, also has what looks like a bear flag with a break of um, support around 5,000, setting up potentially a much bigger drop down into around the 4,800 region on the S&P. Uh, and then finally with the Dow, also same thing happening with the 10 day exponential moving average back below it. I think the Dow is right now it's at 37,780. Uh, pretty clear that if we break this level, the next spot is 37,160 with our support region, with our resistance zone up at 38,560. But if you get rates moving up and you get a stronger dollar following Powell, uh, the market looks like it's pretty primed here to see a significant decline in the next coming, in the next several days to weeks. Anyway, I hope you have a great week and we'll see you next week. Bye.